please use your liberty to promote ours. That powerful plea was written in a 1997 New York Times op-ed by Myanmar's now de facto civilian leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. She's one of the most influential leaders in the world and today, one of the most controversial. She's won a Nobel Peace Prize and spent years under house arrest as a political prisoner. But despite being the democratic icon that she's been for decades, many believe Suu Kyi has failed to uphold her own principles when it comes to others, like Myanmar's Muslim minority, the Rohingya. Hey guys, I'm Sana, welcome to AJ Plus, and this Sunday I want to talk about Aung San Suu Kyi's powerful rise as a symbol of democratic struggle and the controversy that now threatens to undermine everything she's been celebrated for. So Aung San Suu Kyi's story begins with her dad, Major General Aung San. He's the icon of independence in Myanmar having fought against the British. He laid the foundation for the Union of Burma, which is what Myanmar was called before 1989. Aung San didn't live long enough to see his dreams of a free and democratic Burma. He was assassinated in 1947, right before the country was granted independence from the British. At age 15, Aung San Suu Kyi left Burma with her brothers and mother for India. At that time, her mother was appointed as the ambassador to the country. Aung San Suu Kyi would go on to spend most of the following years outside Myanmar, eventually moving to the UK, which became her home. Now, while there was all this movement in her life, Myanmar had gone through some major political upheavals from a democratic country to coming under junta rule in 1962. The coup was led by General Ne Win and resulted in an isolated, corruption-filled country where political dissent was crushed. But it wasn't until 25 years later when Suu Kyi returned to care for her sick mother that she decided to take a stand against what was happening in the country. 1988 was a big turning point for Myanmar. Massive protests against the junta started forming in the streets and Suu Kyi was moved by what she was seeing. She started making political speeches and the people were listening. And by the way, when I say massive protests, I'm talking about half a million students and civilians. And that kind of people power freaked out the military government who responded with violence. Despite the crackdown, Aung San Suu Kyi, with her charismatic speeches, her father's name, became the voice of the opposition. <laughs> and the government noticed her influence and placed her under house arrest. At the same time, in an effort to prevent further protests, they also agreed to hold an election in a few years. This was when the military decided to change the country's name from Burma to Myanmar. It was a way of saying, hey, we're here and we're not going anywhere. Now, the military government did hold a vote in 1990, expecting to be reconfirmed as the country's legitimate leaders. Instead, guess what happened? Aung San Suu Kyi and her party, the National League for Democracy, won. That vote should have returned Myanmar to a democracy. But the military government ordered Suu Kyi to stay under house arrest and spent the next several years trying to curb her political power. We'll have to create opportunities to do more as a political party to operate as a political party. The generals even enacted a constitutional amendment that banned her from becoming president. Instead of sinking into irrelevance, Aung San Suu Kyi actually became more influential during her house arrest. Since she believed in the non-violent activism of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., she found power in following the government's house arrest orders. She stayed behind her fence, but would hoist herself up to give speeches to the crowds that would gather in her yard. It was this sort of resolve that earned her the admiration of both the people of Myanmar and the international community which awarded her the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991. Aung San Suu Kyi went on like this for over 20 years. And then Myanmar reached a boiling point. Massive protests once again broke out in the streets, and this time it was thousands of saffron-robed monks who led the uprising. The world couldn't ignore news of the military government beating protesting monks, and then the killing of a Japanese photojournalist, Kenji Nagai, who was shot dead while covering the demonstrations. There were global protests calling for peace in Myanmar and for Aung San Suu Kyi to be freed. This this increased international pressure on military generals to give up control led to a series of moderate reforms, including releasing Suu Kyi from house arrest in 2010. The junta also held a new round of elections, and since Aung San Suu Kyi was a free woman, she was poised to finally take her place as leader of the country. But the military refused to lift the constitutional ban on her becoming president. That amendment, by the way, states that anyone with foreign-born children can hold the office. 
So she couldn't become president, but she still became the civilian leader of the country. When her party won in 2015, she instead was given the position of state councillor, which has given her the power and influence to lead the country. This moment was seen as monumental, that maybe this was it. This was Myanmar's transition back into a democratic country. But there's one issue that's overshadowed Suu Kyi's fight for freedom and her legacy, the Rohingya. The Rohingya are a Muslim minority ethnic group living in Myanmar in the western state of Rakhine. Now, the Rohingya are forced to live in some pretty abysmal conditions. They are not considered citizens, they have very few rights, and they face violence from the military and from civilians, including organized mobs of monks. Human rights groups have shown that the systematic violence towards the Rohingya has been tantamount to ethnic cleansing, even genocide. And while the violence against and the displacement of the Rohingya started well before Suu Kyi came into power, there was this belief among many that now that she was free, she'd be able to advocate for the rights of the Rohingya. But she didn't, and she hasn't. Instead, in a 2017 interview with the BBC, she denied ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya. I don't think there's ethnic cleansing going on. I think ethnic cleansing is too strong of an expression to use for what's happening. But many in the international community vehemently disagreed. I heard allegation after allegation of horrific events like these. Slitting of throats, indiscriminate shootings, setting alight houses with people tied up inside and throwing very young children into the fire, as well as gang rapes and other sexual violence. She's also denied entry to UN teams into the Trouble Rakhine State, teams who want to investigate the conditions of the Rohingya. Critics have also pointed to additional shortcomings, including ongoing military conflicts in other regions, the jailing of critics, and a general lack of transparency within her government. And in an interview with Al Jazeera, sources who worked with her have said that she doesn't listen, doesn't like to be questioned, and runs her party like a dictator. And though she is trying to lead a country that's been under a military dictatorship for decades, so far her story hasn't exactly turned out as some thought it would. And maybe the better question to ask is if Aung San Suu Kyi will use her liberty to promote the liberty of others. So the story of Aung San Suu Kyi unfolded in a really unexpected way. What do you guys think? Did you guys know about Aung San Suu Kyi and what do you think about her now? Let us know in the comments and also let us know other people that you want us to profile, whether they're leaders of movements, of parties, of countries. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe and tune in next Sunday when we come at you with another great video.